At First Baptist Church, our mission is to follow our Lord Jesus Christ and to lead all others to a joyful life with Him. Our hope is that you will encounter Jesus Christ in such a way that you will have joyful news to go and tell. Turn with me now to the reverse text. It's in your bulletin, Matthew 6, 25 through 34. And we're going to read reverse in its entirety. So if you would stand with me and we're going to read this aloud together. This then is the text for today. For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink nor for your body as to what you will put on, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow nor do they or gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all of his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, much more clothe you, you of little faith. Do not worry then, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. All these things shall be added unto you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. May God bless the reading of his word. The word seek, S-E-E-K, can lead to childhood memories of hiding in quiet corners of a barn waiting your cousin's who are charged with finding you. When, when, when you play hide and seek, the goal is to remain hidden. But the challenge is to find those who don't want to be found. See, this is the, the typical sort of thing that we think of when we think of the word seek. S-E-E-K. And as we grow older into adulthood, it it remains very similar. Seek evokes qualities that, that seem elusive. We seek peace. We seek security. Those sorts of things. And the natural assumption when we think of that word seek is that that which you seek is both limited and that it's in hiding. That what you're seeking requires great difficulty to be found. So there are adults all over who do this kind of thing. They seek hidden treasures. Scour the globe for Fabergé eggs dig trenches for miles for lost crown jewels, go to the ends of the earth for hidden gold. Those guys on that TV show, Oak Island, have been coming up empty for nearly a decade. (laughs) These, These dramatic and highly unlikely instances are the kinds of things that we think of when we imagine seeking that which is to be found. And that word, as we think of it, it it evokes something within us, and it hints is what Jesus taught us last week. 
In fact, this week builds on last week. Last week, Jesus was teaching us about money. That we as humans worship money. It's pretty remarkable. You, you can get throngs of people trekking perilously across Rocky Mountain crags with the hint of money on the other side. The mystery gets us, but the glimmer of gold is hypnotizing. See, after, after Jesus teaches us about money, he then gets to the heart of our tendencies. Jesus says, instead, seek first the kingdom of God. It's interesting, too. This, this is a, a refrain throughout Scripture. Pastor Aaron read it early, earlier for us from Psalms. There's a number of places in Psalms where it, it says the like. God's, God's word is, is more valuable than, than any treasure on this earth. The treasure sought and found by anyone who, who will focus on what God has to say to us. Listen, read, pray. There, there's priceless treasure in these pages. I do think it's interesting that here in Matthew 6, Jesus answers the cynics here. A cynic would, would read something like this and, and look into the Word of God and say there are wonderful quips here. Great advice to be found. And cynics do as cynics do and the cynic complains. I can't feed my family with red letters. But Jesus is definitive here. It's not currency that supplies your need. Gold does not keep you warm at night. God does. And God alone. So we talk about this word seek. You know, we, we need to talk about what it is. When, when Jesus uses the word seek here in Matthew 6, he's not talking about looking for something scarce. Like it's very different. He, he, he focuses on, on that which is abundant. You know, it's interesting. Even, even sometimes we talk about the word of God and, and we talk about this as a, as, as a sense of a mining operation of the treasures of God, we, we often find ourselves looking for something no one's ever heard before. We're looking for something we've never seen before, which, which is in and of itself ridiculously prideful. But it's also not the point here. Jesus is, is reminding us to, to seek the long-standing and, and available principles of the kingdom of God, to focus on the things that Jesus taught to make the way of Jesus the priority of our lives. Seeking Jesus here isn't finding something that no one else knows, but focusing on that which no one else will focus on, Jesus Christ himself. You see a progression in the text. He starts with the word seek, and then we get to first, seek first. And, and this word's the same. It's kind of like with the word seek. If we're not careful, we can misunderstand seek. And the same thing with this word first. If we're not careful, we're gonna misunderstand what Jesus means when he says seek first. Because in our Christian infancy, I know this is true of myself and I know it's true of, of most of us, in our Christian infancy, when we hear that word first, we, we naturally assume that means if I do something for God, early in the day, then we can do whatever we want the rest of the day, right? God, God is covered, so then I can go then do whatever else I want. So that if I have a quiet time in the morning, re reading a devotional or something like that, which is wonderful, then, then we say, well, I've done that which needs to be done first. And I can cross that responsibility off my list. I sought first, as if our relationship with God was something like brushing our teeth. If I do it and I get it out of the way, then I'm fine from here on out. 
But that's, that's not what first means here. In, in this text, when you think of the word first, it says seek first. There's this, it's a level of superiority. It's a, it's a comprehensive attitude. It's a, that which is above all else, that which is in front of everything else, that which is behind every, everything else, the, the primary focus of everything in and of life. So instead of saying something like, my morning routine is I brush my teeth, I drink my coffee, I seek God in scripture, I eat my breakfast, I drive to my work, where seeking God is one step that includes a whole lot of seeking yourself and seeking your boss and seeking your spouse. And, and, and by the end of it, by the end of the day, God got something like 20 minutes of focus when everything else got exponentially more. God got a piece of your morning, but you sought yourself for eight hours that day. Nowhere in the scripture does it say, seek yourself. Not a single line. You see, our fleshly tendency is to seek myself. And, and we, we actually adhere to this kind of natural commission this is what Jesus gave us the great commission and he said this is the way. Most of us default to a sort of natural commission which is go and be selfish. Go and take care of you. Go and tend to your wants and your feelings. Provide for me first and everyone else if you get the chance. But God never says that. He never says, go and be selfish. He never says, go and take care of you. He says, seek God. Seek his righteousness and everything else will be added. Everything else will fall into place. Now, we'll say this. The, the only sense in which you get a, a, a close to a spiritual selfishness is something like this, that as we grow in our faith, what the Spirit does is the Spirit helps us realize that actually the best possible thing for me is to deny myself and take up my cross and follow Jesus. And that my life will be so much greater than whatever I've produced for myself if I will deny myself and follow Jesus where he's leading. So seeking is something more like this than seeking first is seeking God in my toothbrush, seeking God in my coffee, seeking God in scripture, seeking God in breakfast, seeking God when I drive to work, seeking God as I go throughout my day and all of the things I was called to do, seeking God as I come home, seeking God as I rest that life itself in the Spirit of God has a new curiosity that looks for the movement of God everywhere. And, and in fact, following Jesus is a, is a waiting and a watching. And, and following Jesus is us, our eyes wide open, anticipating what God might do next in our lives what realities God will bring into existence that we never dreamed of as he reveals himself to us. And so Jesus gives us this prescription, seek first, focus fully. And, and then he gives us those two things, we're gonna take them together, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And before we talk about what those are, seek first his kingdom, his righteousness, we need to talk about what those aren't. And, and Jesus makes a specific note here, not only to the worldly cynics, but to the Christian cynics. This is not your kingdom, and this is not your righteousness. Our flesh wants it to be, that we want to build our own kingdoms. And, and even in the church, we have this habit of creating our own sense of righteousness. 
And, and as we do, it, it kind of happens on our half flaker lots in some subdivision, and, and, and we, we like to feel that we are royal in our castle. But, but the kingdoms and, and the righteousness that we create only bring division because we're acting on scarcity. And we have this limited and weak version of life that's something akin to a reality TV show, which is to say when we're seeking our own kingdoms and our own righteousness, we are royal frauds, unable. And and you see, what's true of these earthly kingdoms we build is true of the righteousness that we create This is typically how it goes for us. Any sense of goodness that we claim is is practically in comparison to somebody else. It's the the sense of relative uh, righteousness, that I'm better than them. See, in our fleshly hearts, we remember something good that we did and something we did good better than somebody else where I kept my cool and they didn't keep their cool. You know, I, I took care of my kid, they didn't take care of their kid. And, and this relative goodness where we say, I must be pretty good when I compare myself to that person in that instance, where we think we will stand before God and claim some sense of goodness because I was better than that person. This is not a heavenly reality. This is a fraudulent reality of relative righteousness that does not work in heaven. It has no bearing on reality or our lives. It is a red herring that brings a false sense of security and superiority that we have to get rid of. You see, as we develop our kingdoms and we develop our righteousness, it will always prove to be a house of cards blown over by the slightest breeze. And so we we take Jesus' words seriously here when he says his, and that should be underlined, it should be highlighted, his kingdom, his righteousness. So what, are we, what are we looking for there? We says seek first, focus fully on him. So let, let's start with, with God's kingdom. And we think about God's kingdom this morning. There's a number of different ways for us to think about it, but I want us to think about it this way. I want us to think about it this morning as two perpendicular roads. And on, on one, one street, there, there many people find themselves here and it's, it's a street of conviction. It's a, it's a street of, of, of judgment. And, and it is a difficult road of self-reflection that most people find unpleasant. That's one road. The other, the other road is this road of grace. It's often spoken of as, as the love of God. Here flows mercy and compassion, and, and many will tell you they, they like that road. It feels more rosy. But when we talk about these, these two roads, the kingdom of God isn't either one of them. The kingdom of God is where these two roads intersect. The kingdom of God is is where conviction meets grace, where both are on full display at the same time. Conviction for deep sin with this wild and wonderful mercy of God flowing from heaven to bring compassion with his justice. You know, when we think about Jesus' words that began his ministry, we go back to Matthew chapter four. It begins in this sense of repentance. Matthew four seventeen says, the first words of Jesus' ministry were what? Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This, this is a moment of conviction for the believer. This is a moment of conviction for the church. A self-assessment that reveals the deep brokenness in our lives and hidden sins that we refuse to dredge up. When the kingdom of God comes, everything is exposed. It comes as a brilliant light, 
by which nothing remains hidden, but everything is brought out of the darkness and into the healing sunlight of Jesus Christ. You see, the kingdom of God will always reveal every failure present in your life, even every failure present in the church. And as God's kingdom comes, We meet at the cross, at this intersection of conviction and grace, and there we find healing that restores our heart into holiness. You know, there's there's lots of places in the Gospels where, where Jesus talks about the kingdom of God. It's a good thing to work through. One of those places we find in Luke 17, and as Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God there, it's in this moment of physical healing But as with Jesus, the the physical healing wasn't the thing that mattered. It it was was about the power of Jesus to transform a person, to heal the inward parts, the heart, the soul, and bring about this righteousness that's not our own, right? Which is the second part of this phrase. It's, It's his kingdom and it's his righteousness. And those two phrases are to be taken together. It is one. These are the intersection of conviction and grace there where we find the cross of Jesus Christ. It it is he who is now our righteousness. Not of ourselves so that not one of us can boast but of the Savior himself so that he receives all the glory for that which is done. At that cross, our sinfulness was rectified. He bore the punishment so that we might know a holiness not of our own effort. It is his righteousness. So Jesus tells us, seek first his kingdom, his righteousness. We focus fully on this work of the cross, its, its healing power, its redemptive nature in our lives. And we, we, we are known It's known that we are not good, but we have been saved by the grace of God in the blood of Jesus Christ. You know, the wonderful thing about all of this is that this grace that flows from the mercy seat of heaven, it is neither scarce nor is it hard to find. The promise of Scripture is that the grace of God is abundant and it's available to every one of us this morning, to every sinner in this place. Jesus pulls it all together. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and everything else will be added to you. Let's pray together. Lord, help us to experience this this morning. We we wanna grow in our faith. We, We wanna trust you for everything. We, we want to trust you with everything. Help us, Jesus. Let us know your spirit this morning. We, we pray that you would just turn our hearts to you. Be, be the relief that we need. Lord, would you lift the burdens off of our shoulders? Lord, we ask the burden of guilt would be removed this morning. And Lord, we we pray you would lift the burden of provision off of our shoulders this morning. Every one of us had moments in our lives where we truly believed we were the provider. And Lord, we pray that you would forgive us for that nonsense. Take that burden off. 
And let us know the relief of the power of God in this place. It's in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.